I'm starting. Uh, today we have a conversation with uh, Kian. Uh, he is uh, host of uh, Nietzsche podcast and uh, moderator on Reddit. Hello, Kian. It's true. Yeah. Guilty as charged of moderating on Reddit. <laughs> uh, how did um, you, you know, start this uh, moderate moderating on Nietzsche stuff? Uh, for the longest time in the Nietzsche subreddit, there was just a single moderator and he had to deal with, um, I mean, so on a subreddit that size, it's really a thankless job. Um, it's not, I can understand why it would attract people who have like need a power trip or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in general, most of what you do is just remove like spam bots mm -hmm. and uh, like have to deal with like suspending people for just saying shit to other human beings that they should never say like <laughs> in a polite conversation and then deal with their ban appeals and all that it's not really any fun and he was just handling it all himself and then he needed to take some time off and asked me to step in and i had already been i'd spent a year or two just making the subreddit my personal project where i was like trying to build up the wiki page and mm -hmm. uh, actually have like a well of resources there for people to learn about Nietzsche because a lot of the the content at that time it was just the same questions over and over and over again you know uh, everyone reads Nietzsche and goes on and if they if they haven't read any supplemental materials or they just read one book you get the same questions who is the Ubermensch did Nietzsche say we could mm -hmm. be an Ubermensch mm -hmm. um you know what it would did Nietzsche say god is dead is a good thing or a bad thing you know all the all these mm -hmm. questions um and so i'd been working for a couple of years to have a resource on there so people could you know it's just really frequently asked questions page but because it's nietzsche as a philosopher making a frequently asked questions page is a very complicated thing because they're not easy questions to answer when somebody asks you well who is the ubermensch really it's like that's not an easy question. You mm -hmm. have to understand like all of these contextual things in Nietzsche's philosophy. So that was basically, that's my roundabout way of saying that was a very long project and several other people joined in. Like I wasn't the only one, but a lot of people sort of tried to build this wiki on the subreddit. And so that was why uh, he asked me like, hey, can you help me out with this, um, with moderating? Um, it was basically just, uh two years of <laughs> uh doing a bunch of you know nerdy uh obsessive um maintenance of the subreddit for you know no one's benefit but my own and for the love of nietzsche that now i'm suddenly moderating a subreddit which is even makes it even less fun to go on the subreddit than it ever was and mm -hmm. i hardly ever contribute there anymore <laughs> because of that reason how much time uh, did you really spend on you know this mod moderating stuff like an hour a day a few hours a day or no it's not that much time um it's usually like in 15 20 minute oh, okay. chunks yeah. of the day and if you just check i mean most days because you know there's like 20 or 25,000 people i think who are subscribed and then the daily traffic is in the tens of thousands mm -hmm. um which is like for Reddit, actually pretty small. Um, now, I, I'm not aware if there's another philosopher who has a subreddit that big, which is kind of cool. Like philosophy as a subreddit, that obviously has like millions yeah. of people who go there. But when I think about other individual philosophers, Nietzsche almost is unique in the respect of, of how he has a following around him. Mm -hmm. um, which is a good uh, and a bad thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what, what, why is a good and bad thing? Like what, um, what, what, because what, what, what's, what's, and I can understand what's good about it, what's bad. Like it. Um, what's bad? It's, it's that what, does the it popularity. Vul you vulgarize ideas of nature or, you know, make it over simple. You could say that. Mm -hmm. You could say that. I think what a uh, good way to put it would be, Nietzsche often writes about how his ideas will 
what does he say? Our highest insights must sound like follies and even like crimes when heard mm -hmm. by the ears of those who are not meant for them. Mm -hmm. It's in Beyond Good and Evil book two somewhere. Um, and, you know, whatever, whatever is loved by the many, uh, what does he say? It usually stinks is the metaphor he uses actually. He talks about the bad air of the church, right? That's where all the masses congregated back in his day. Um, but it's, it's like, so the pop, the excessive popularity of a philosopher who specifically wrote in a way, he actually says, I, I try my best to be misinterpreted myself and to mm -hmm. be misunderstood mm -hmm. um, at times. So it, it's just, it's a combination that creates misunderstanding and I think invites people, tempts people to, I don't know, to tempts people who maybe sh shouldn't read Nietzsche. I'll just put it like that. Mm -hmm. so um, some, to read some, him and some sort of irony in, in this, right? So he writes for 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 the few, but finally he becomes yes. one of the most popular philosopher who is uh, yes. most misunderstood by, you know, and in, uh, interpret in many different ways. Right. Oh, and he says, uh, I mean, he um, it's in Zarathustra. There's a Zarathustra's ape. The, mm. the, the nickname for the man who goes and he preaches misinterpretations of Zarathustra's uh, sermons and is more popular than the original Zarathustra, if I remember <laughs> correctly. Um, and so Nietzsche even like recognizes that that's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess he, that's the thing, in his wildest dreams, you would hope that you would be, because let's be honest, as any philosopher you or any artist, you're trying to uh, speak spread or, or or you know like spread the gospel of your artwork or your philosophy mm -hmm. as far and wide as you can even if you're right for the few or whatever Nietzsche says and so um you know you should be so lucky as to have misinterpreters and to have a to have Zarathustra's ape out there mm -hmm. um but um it's funny that he at the time when he you know lived there's no indication he would ever be that popular and he was already imagining he imagined that exact situation that we're in. So that's kind of funny to me as well. Yeah, I guess why people do, call him a prophet. In one of his uh, last book, Eke Homo, he was writing about, you know, the future of his own philosophy. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what, in what sections, but uh, there definitely was this, this sense that he understood himself as uh, one of the greater thinker thinkers and, yeah uh, and he believed that his uh, influence like he said like about Zarathustra for example that this book is like you know the best book ever produced by right. you know humanity not just in the past but you know for all the time like, well, he it, says it, in it, it was, Homo, I yeah, think my, uh, gift, my gift to humanity right my yeah the best gift to humanity which could probably be given to, to it I, th I think the way he puts it in Eke Homo is that he like divides all, he says we should um, like mark off the calendar based on yeah, all of the yeah. philosophy before and after him. Well, it's is... like the when he, the last sentence, Dionysus uh, against uh, Christ, like he basically yeah. tries to fra frame it in a way that, you know, I'm kind of new prophet and now. Right. Yeah. Why not? Why not uh, calculate from the end of Christianity rather than the beginning? Yeah. Which is yeah. today. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the podcast? Like you started uh, uploading these, uh, you know, talks or how would I call them? Like you, the, 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 the podcast, I mean, like your audio version, like on Spotify and on YouTube, when you, uh, as far as I understand, you just read certain like essays, right? Oh, it's like, as far as like how it's done. So um, what I do, some of the... Uh, some of the episodes are more like that, mm -hmm. but um, it's, I mean, so I've heard a couple of people call them lectures mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm not a professor. I'm not even a college graduate. So mm -hmm. I have no idea of how uh, a lecture is given, but from my understanding, that is pretty similar to what I, I do where mm -hmm. there are some things that are outright written um, but I allow myself the ability to have digressions, um, mm -hmm. and it's mostly notes and all of the chunks of text that I want to quote. 
um, I have all that in a Word document, and then I'll have notes on what commentary I'd like to give. Um, and then it could just follow with the notes, but occasionally like a story comes to mind or something like that, or um, something that I, I didn't remember to write down comes to mind mm -hmm. um, or some other connection, you know, like I, I, so when I listen back to the episodes to sort of screen them and make sure I don't need to like, oh, you said that syllable really weird, um, mm -hmm. retake that or cut this or that out. Um, like I noticed when I was screening the Antichrist episodes, like I made reference to like Alan Watts, like in each episode, like that wasn't ever written down or planned for. It's just, I remembered as I was talking about it, that it's basically that Nietzsche's interpretation of Jesus is like almost the same as Alan Watts. It's just that Alan Watts is presenting Jesus as this exemplar of, um, cosmic consciousness whereas Nietzsche is saying <laughs> Jesus is the epitome of weakness so they have mm -hmm. opposite valuations of it but they both basically believe that Jesus you know uh, lived in this imminent um, this imminent sense of being not of this earth and everything on this world being an empty illusion mm -hmm. um, you know Alan Watts sees that as sort of enlightenment <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Nietzsche sees that mm -hmm. as uh, the, yeah, the, the opposite of it. a brain disease <laughs> or, <laughs> or a body disease, we might say. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so anyway, that's just an example of something that a comparison that came to mind that wasn't planned. But for the most part, like the so the first episode, I'm pretty much just reading a script. Like some of them, it's pretty much like that. I'm working on an audiobook for the Dionysus Dithyrams, where I wrote out an introduction that I'm just going to read mm -hmm. out as a script. So occasionally I do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, does it help you understand better, like Nietzsche, when you record these uh, lectures, or you already like you already have certain yeah. understanding and you just share it, uh, trying to you know make sense? Of well, so at the point I'm at now, a lot of what I am covering. So I mean, the answer would be yes, because in I read Nietzsche for many, many years. And then mm -hmm. I started writing my own philosophy. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. When was the um, first time when you when you encountered Nietzsche? Like, do you remember the year? Uh, in college. In college. In college. Oh, okay. That would be the year two thousand and six. Mm -hmm. And so, um, during that time, I was more interested in Nietzsche out of atheism, mm -hmm. like. That was my hobby horse was atheism. And so, um, and I remember, I remember reading Nietzsche and like, uh, so to give a background of what I had read before that, I had read like Bertrand Russell, Why I'm Not a Christian, which is very funny because Bertrand Russell is an atheist, but he hates Nietzsche more. I, I shouldn't say hate. I don't think he, but you know, he, he rejects Nietzsche more thoroughly than um most of the other philosophers you know you could think of um but i had read him and like christopher hitchens books and you know i was one of those i was like a new atheist type type guy and i'm from austin texas and if any you know people on youtube are probably familiar with matt dillahunty and the atheist experience um that was a public access tv show in austin texas mm -hmm. so like I, Austin Zaro always had like a strong atheist community and it was always of that vibe of like the, the, the lot, the logical atheist who can take down all the traditional theistic arguments. And so that's sort of like what I was like looking for. And then I picked up like, and then we, we read some excerpts from Nietzsche in class. And I remember I had to sort of compare and pick one of the atheist arguments to favor. And I remember saying Freud was much better than Nietzsche at the time. And mm -hmm. then I picked up the antichrist because I wanted a little more. And I remember just being like, what the hell is this? This isn't like, it had nothing to do with any of those arguments because Christianity is just assumed to be, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's assumed to be false. That's not even a question that enters into Nietzsche's mind. Like he's just sort of dismissed all these metaphysical concerns mm -hmm. and it's just immediately starts talking about how 
he immediately begins with like, let us look each other in the face. We are Hyperboreans. And I was just like, well, I have no idea what any of this means. And so I put Nietzsche down and didn't really come back to him for a couple of years after that. Um, I remember I also got Beyond Good and Evil and I was also like, I don't know what any of this is talking about. You know, I was like 19 years old. So um, that's not the time for mm -hmm. Nietzsche, I don't think. Um, it was much later when I was um, on tour with my band, actually, around like 2013, 2014, when I started reading Nietzsche on the road and I started with The Birth of Tragedy. And that, you know, say what you will about Birth of Tragedy, that work opened up a whole world of possibilities for me, or it was like a, it was just a treasure trove of ideas. Mm -hmm. And even though it's like looking at birth of tragedy in the grand scheme of Nietzsche's thought, um, I wouldn't ever recommend to someone that they introduce themselves to Nietzsche by reading birth of tragedy. Um, but just as like an enjoyable book that sort of like sparks off neurons in your brain, really um, as, as, as fanciful as it is and as flawed as it is um, that really sucked me in. And the book, I mean, he's talking about the Dionysian rituals where I were sure about like self forgetting and losing yourself. And I'm like, meanwhile, and, and how this is like in this inextricable dance with the Apollinean, which is self-creation, the projection of an image, self-knowledge and all of this. Um, and meanwhile, I'm on tour with my like heavy metal band mm -hmm. uh, on the road. And so that's like really resonating with me because it's like I'm doing this actually highly structured activity where we are playing a different city every single night. So we have to keep to a rigorous schedule. It's not really when you're in a touring in an underground band, it's not like glamorous. It's actually like exhausting and mm -hmm. like you work. have to be incredibly disciplined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then every night is sort of like justified with this like rambunctious throwing off of all boundaries. And it, it was like, it seemed to be describing what my experience of art was mm -hmm. at that time. And so it immediately hooked me and it gave, and then it gives you this new rich world of metaphors to use that I hadn't heard before. And, and really probably sparked off, I mean, because I had read the Greeks in school as well. That was the book where I was like, oh, there's something much deeper here and worthy of my attention in the Greek philosophers and the Greek culture and all of that. So Nietzsche like started all that. And then from there, I read all of his books over the years since then. And um, yeah, that's sort of where I am now. But that was like, so I... The, that was a really long answer because really I read Nietzsche, but the first time I really read Nietzsche was when I read Birth of Tragedy. Mm -hmm. Like that I actually understood what I was reading and cared about it. So, but now you're also trying to incorporate Schopenhauer and uh, other, like well, Roche Foucault, for example, one of your other podcasts mm -hmm. when you talk about the influence on Nietzsche by other thinkers. Are you reading all of them or? just uh, partly take some you know some some ideas right and, mm -hmm. so that's the wonderful thing about the um lifestyle of being a touring musician that i did for many years before the pandemic was you have so much time to read and so i read quite a few books that i probably wouldn't have otherwise set aside the time to read because i also the ba the bass player i was playing with he was very much into uh, philosophy himself and fiction. So he introduced me to like Robert Persig and Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and Eric Fromm, art of human destructiveness. And um, who else? He was really into Bertrand Russell as well and Wittgenstein and in a lot more fiction as well. He, he introduced me to Dostoevsky actually. Mm -hmm. um, then he quit the band in 2017 and it just so happens our next bass player is even more erudite and this quiet guy who's incredibly pensive and hardly talks at all. And all he does is read. And he turned me on to La Rochefoucauld mm -hmm. um, because I had heard, you know, from reading Nietzsche um, and he was a fan of Nietzsche as well. And he, he was like, you really need to read these. And, and it, it, we shared a lot of, you know, like um, he's also, he's speaks fluent French. So, 
he was very interested for me to read like Montaigne and Voltaire and all these French philosophers. So I kind of got that from him. Um, Schopenhauer, I always had an interest in um, ever since I read his essays. And that was around the time when I was getting into to Nietzsche um, because I was initially very pessimistic when I was getting into Nietzsche. And that was like, it wasn't like I read Nietzsche and that switch flipped overnight. I mean, I was more in the Schopenhauerian camp. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I hadn't been totally familiar with Schopenhauer, I had read like Chiron and um, a couple of just other like pessimistic, you know, Lagodi's conspiracy against the human race and all that. And um, so, yeah, that's sort of how different different thinkers got uh, incorporated. So uh, all that's to say now when I'm doing the podcast, um, I am eventually going to have to get into influences of Nietzsche's that I hadn't read like Heraclitus was one of those where mm -hmm. the podcast led me to investigate Heraclitus and the pre-Platonic philosophers. So that's something I've dived into because that, that book is um, it's like a, it's a compilation of Nietzsche's lecture notes that they cobbled into a book or the translator arranged. And so it's, I think in the episode, I called it the most important book Nietzsche never wrote because mm -hmm. I'd, ne I'd never read it. I didn't even really know it was available until I found a PDF of it. And then, um, yeah. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot about Heraclitus through that and Nietzsche's lectures. So there, there will be some things, but a lot of the reading I've done over the years has been informed also by what, what Nietzsche's influences are. That's sort of how I've, you know, just with the exchange of ideas of people I know, but also looking at who Nietzsche talks about and going mm -hmm. back and reading them. Um, and, and that's another way that I thought the podcast could just be a general philosophy podcast because you can start at Nietzsche and you can branch off into the past and into the future. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, let me ask you about like, the question of will. Uh, I guess it started from Schopenhauer, like will to life, mm. and then it uh, moved on to will, to will to power in Nietzsche. And there's also such mm -hmm. thing as will to truth. Like, is there any yeah. difference? Is there any real distinction between uh, those three or is just, you know, certain words we, which we use for the same thing? So, Will, I think this is one of those areas where language gets really interesting because mm -hmm. in German philosophy, Wille or Will, um, that word, I think, takes on a connotation that is also of... Um, what would we say when we talk about will it's usually in a sort of almost abstract um, sense in English, like, do you have the willpower to do this task or something like mm -hmm. that? Whereas saying someone wills something, I think it's important to bring in the, the context that Nietzsche or Schopenhauer talk about it. Willing is acting as well. It's like what you, I guess what, what's complicated is that, we also have this idea of the voluntarily governing free will, right? Mm -hmm. Where, mm -hmm. which is uh, we'll, yeah, we'll get to how that. most of us, mm -hmm. well, that's how most of us conceive of the will. But what's interesting about that is that it's not nonsensical in our current, what would you say, our current philosophical superstructure that most people think in to say that I wanted one thing and I wanted another thing, right? Um, you know, I want, I want to, I want to be fit, but I also want to eat that delicious cherry pie. I want to go take time to go to the gym, but I also want to go see my girlfriend. Right. And so we see ourselves as having all these different wants and desires. Yeah, I guess so it's um, impossible it, it, to say that, you know, I want to play video games and I don't want to play video games. Like to have the opposite desires. Right. You know? mm -hmm. Right. Well, and yet. I would say some people do have desire, like an alcoholic might be like, I want to drink alcohol and I don't mm. want to drink yeah, alcohol. Yeah. People do experience that. Um, but so to say you will something, I think we need to understand is beyond that. What you will is what you actually do. Mm. What That's the one that actually, you can say, oh, I had all these wants and desires, but really what, where your will was aimed, it's almost like a psycho... It's Nietzsche anticipating a psychoanalytic approach, um, or, or rather what Schopenhauer and Nietzsche would write would inform the psychoanalysts that um, one of the ways that you can analyze um, what somebody somebody's intentions were, were 
look at what they actually did. And so in many cases, even when outcomes arise that people say, well, I didn't want this, that's still where your will was aimed, um, even though you might have had all these competing desires. And so willing is doing is the important thing. The, the, the only thing that's going to stop your will from doing something is if it's obstructed in some way. And that obstruction could be, it could be another desire. But um, like the logic of that though, is that the strongest desire will be what you will. So there's always, there's always somewhere where your will is aimed. And that's basically then, and that, and that, in taking it through to then the next level, well, your will could be obstructed by some external force as well. And so true, you, your will might not actually do the thing that it wills, right? But we have to, we have to sort of unify those concepts and that when Nietzsche is talking about the will to power, what he means is everything in actuality seeks after power. Uh, and it, it actually does this. It's not just like it wants power in some abstract sense in the way that you could want to drink and want not to drink. When he says the will to power, he's saying all of those actions that you're taking in some sense are the act of moving towards power. Now, will to truth is a great example. It's not the only other will that Nietzsche permits, um, but it's a great example of what he might call a sublimation, um, where in our conscious mind, everything we're doing is acting towards power, but our conscious mind makes different evaluations. And this is according to like the morality that our community has uh, impressed into us from a young age. Um, all of the random experiences of our lives, our upbringing and our, our nature and so, so on and so forth. Um, in the course of that, we might want to obfuscate the will to power for whatever reason. So, uh, you know, in our society, we might say that being a power seeking person or an ambitious person is looked down upon. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, if you look at like all of the people in the sciences and in academia, you could, you could just say, well, those people are just truth seekers. What Nietzsche is saying is that will to truth is a sublimation of the will to power that when that professor goes and publishes 50 papers, and it's more than all of the colleagues he directly works with, that's his way of being above them. Um, that's their way of feeling. It's not just power in the sense of social standing, though. We also have to understand it in the sense of feeling powerful and potent. So in some sense, like while the social standing matters, even just fulfilling, feeling like a hyperproductive acad academic, right? Mm -hmm. That is a, that's experiencing your power. You're going through a process where you tackle something challenging and um, overcome it. And that's basically how he defines, how Nietzsche defines uh, the will to power is overcoming. That, it, that what is happiness is feeling that resistance is being overcome. So we find challenges, we move past them, and the will to power ultimately, what it what it aims at is escalating challenges and ever increasing difficulties to conquer, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Whereas, so what's interesting about Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer defines will in more or less the way that probably most of us would understand human nature following like the Richard Dawkins and the new atheist I mentioned before, will to live, mm -hmm. just like the will to exist. Um, it, it's like when we say everyone does, you know, everything is out of a survival instinct or, or this is just like life's will to survive. That's why we all have a will to live. Um, Nietzsche doesn't believe that's true. And I, I think he could, I think it's like almost self-evident actually from Darwinism that it's not true um, because what, where it gets tricky is like, you could say really it's the species that matters and not the individual. And so there's a ton of animals that will willingly die. Like salmon will kill themselves trying to spawn. So they clearly don't have a will to live, right? They, what they have a will to do is to, reproduce and generate themselves not to be you know not 
they're not the same forever. It's not the same individual. It's not immortality, but, but it's the species continuing and all of these different individuals. That is, I think, why that's how we can understand Nietzsche modifying Schopenhauer's will to live. Is he basically says, this does not explain everything. Um, just endlessly wanting to exist and live on is not what Nietzsche sees at the base of how life behaves. He sees life wanting to endlessly generate itself into these more and more powerful forms, which we could say is in abstract terms, not a bad description of evolution of how it works. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though we would say it, it's like, oh, it's survival of the fittest. I guess you could say Schopenhauer focuses on the survival part. Nietzsche focuses on the fittest part. But that's what it's aimed at is fitness. Um, and so that's how I would answer that question. Uh, do, do you think that will to truth is uh, just an ultimate expression of certain will to power? I mean, when you like for for a philosopher, I guess in one of the aphorisms in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche says that uh, will to truth is essentially uh, like uh, first of all, he says that you know there's no just will to truth. It's not uh, there's also will to deception and will to the untruth, and yeah. uh, it's kind of a condition. Like uh, if I remember correctly, it's like fourth. Uh, fourth paragraph when he says that to recognize uh, the will to like not to recognize untruth as a condition of life uh, is to impugn the uh, you know traditional ideals of value in a very dangerous manner and uh, this idea yeah. that, that will to truth uh, it uh, becomes a kind of uh, you know an impulse of a philosophy it basically uh, takes over an individual and uh, structures its motive in just one particular way that uh, all he wants to do is simply just ga gaining more and more knowledge and uh, like mm -hmm. seek, see, seeking wisdom or whatever whatever else it may be called You're right well but the thing about the will to truth that makes it sort of special among all the sublimations of will to power although will to deception could be included i mean a lot of the conscious ways that we a lot of the conscious things that we will at are only possible with the intellect but the will to truth is sort of a special one because will how what would you say that form of seeking power this is maybe a good way to get at it mm -hmm. that form of seeking power is seeking power through the use of one's intellect and through having a stronger faculty of reason, having a more critical eye of reason. So, you know, somebody like Socrates, for example, that's Socrates was the best fencing master in all of Athens, as Nietzsche says, meaning the, the battle of wits, right? He, um, he, do, he goes into the symposium and dominates. Uh, he's, he's displaying his power when he knocks down people's presumptions. But what is Socrates? I mean, Socrates is when you, if you evaluate him by the standard of, um, you know, the warrior aristocracies that were the rule that founded states and were the, the we might say like the relevant power structure governing human beings. Um, you know, Socrates is a de degeneration on that. And that's sort of like what Nietzsche's um, terrible insight is that uh, decadence, the weakening of society basically comes with the decoupling of the body and the mind and the intellect become this force because the will to truth might have you um, discard healthy or powerful things because they're not true. Um, they might lead you to understand. Um, and so like one of the things we might consider are just the the advantage of living in the enchanted dream world of, of a religion. And how societies that have that collective net of consciousness are able to do things like inspire people to, what's a good example? Um, during the Iran-Iraq war in the 1970s or 80s, um, at one point, the uh, Iranians um, just recruited a bunch of young men out of school to walk across the minefield to trigger the mines, to clear a path. So that the Iranian army could come come through. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they commemorated them with uh, fountains of uh, that were dyed red to look like fountains of blood all over the city, and all of the uh, people would hang pictures of the portraits of martyrs 
of their son, you know, 14, 15 year old son or whatever, who went and got blown up by mines so that your army could um, fight a war. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you could say uh, is an advantage given to people with a, the collective net of consciousness, as I called it, this religious dream world. What if, what if it is the case, just saying for the sake of argument, that we're overall worse off, we're less cohesive as a society, we're weaker when we don't have that collective net. We don't have the reason to sacrifice because there's nothing beyond ourselves. We're just, you're just a material being with one life to live, right? Why would you sacrifice it for the state? That's crazy. So having that lie that's not true made people like the ancient Greeks or the Iranians during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, a war that they won, even though Iraq had superior weapons, many of them supplied by the Americans and the British, um, you know, um, or successfully fought to a stalemate, whatever, you know, not important. Mm -hmm. Um, That's sort of the problem with the will to truth. And so then the issue becomes that you could see it as sort of, that is the expression of power from the decadent aspect of society or from the, that there, that that's what another way of saying is like, that's how we define decadence is the intellect becoming the starting to attack the powerful things in society. Mm-hmm. It's um, like almost like so the will pre- to truth is sort of dangerous. Almost like a previously cast, uh, right? What you're referring to in one of your podcasts when yeah. you say there's previously cast, which, which uh, possess a different morality from the nobility, right? So it's kind of yes. uh, yeah. uh, the, the oppressed and the oppressors and uh, the previously cast uh, takes the side of the oppressed and start cursing, like uh, the distinction between good and bad and good and evil, right? So first there was just good and bad. Right. And uh, then they created like evil and say, you know, all these powerful guys, they all are, uh, you know, evil with all their motives are... Like, right. Well, and that's the interesting about Nietzsche is he would say like Socrates, that's the birth of like scientific style thought. Most people would say science and religion are inherently opposed, whereas Nietzsche says that's actually the beginning of that type of religion, which is the type you just described, the mm-hmm. Christian based good and evil religion. Um, Socrates, the, the pursuit of the will to truth makes that possible to separate um to separate physical reality from the spiritual reality is really where you get all those things that you describe. And so Mm -hmm. that's how, that's how you have that strange uh, Nietzschean, you know, paradoxically that science and religion come from the same source Um, or not. I shouldn't say religion, but science and our modern ideas of like spirituality, which is um, spirituality divorced from the physical reality. Um, mm-hmm. I would say so it creates kind of uh, extra world in which uh, everything, yeah. everything. I, it's the from the I guess from the first uh, podcast on the fable uh, about how the world, like how the true world, became a fable. Yeah, well, it, it's an extra world. Be the important thing. I mean, yes, there is the extra world, and that is very important. But the consequence of that is has allowed us, us to reject this one. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know, I, I don't think it's impossible to have a religion or a spirituality that unifies Both. body and soul mm-hmm. in this world and so, some sort of spiritual world. Um, the problem is no one believes anything anymore <laughs> spiritually, <laughs> really. Um, and so... And we can, you know, the, the Jordan Petersons of the world can, can hope for a religious revival, but um, that's like, if we look at like the bar graph, religion's going down. Oh, uh, no, no, no. It's going down. Like, you know, you might have some people like Jordan Peterson who come along to re-inspire religion, but it's not, I, I think ultimately Nietzsche is correct. Secularism is the rule of the day. Um, and that is ascendant. And I don't see how um, I haven't worked that one out yet, how we get to a healthier worldview because the worldview we're pursuing now, I don't think is very healthy. Yeah, but still, uh, I, for example, I personally do not believe that science uh, can explain everything about the world. So I'm not on a religious site. I'm not like on a scientific site. I'm trying to like right. investigate as much as possible, but still 
like there are certain aspects of uh, reality which uh, like metaphysics essentially which uh, in, sa- in some sense mm-hmm. like you 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 may, you may try to get rid of it you may try to say like there's only like one like non- non-duality everything is explained mm-hmm. through certain concepts but then you know we have this experience we have future and to say that you know something is certain about the future and something is certain about the past it's uh or our subjective experience which is uh mm-hmm. in some way like i may express it through language and to some degree uh, another person may understand what i feel and how i view the world but essentially still it's it's kind of it's so, it's so strange that only I can perceive this world from one particular point right. of view, which is inaccessible to anybody else in the entire universe. And how in other yeah, it is strange. Yeah, and how in other it is strange perceive perceives Sorry. the world it's like so. And so that there are so many different possibilities just to 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 see the world. And then you know people arguing about this uh, uh, what do they say objective truth, right? Oh, this is just one perspective on the world. We just no, no, we know this because you know this subject of this science, this uh, everything, what we learned so far, and it uh, perfectly explains you know certain patterns which we observe in the social world and you know this mechanical world. But uh, still, like there, from from like you may you, you may find the point of view from which like no one looks at the world, and you may interpret the entire world uh, according to your point of view. Yeah. Um it's yeah the the absolute perspective and i think what would you say the one of the dividing lines between human beings and other primates is theory of mind Mm -hmm. Um, the idea of understanding when you look at someone else oh that is another locus of consciousness that's not me and they actually know things that i don't know um and so even for, from what I understand, people might correct me on this, but even like very smart apes like chimps and orangutans, they're sort of like on the edge of that. But um, they don't really like chimps have like some rudimentary theory of mind where they kind of understand that chimp on that other tree can see things that I might not be able to see from my vantage point, but they don't necessarily understand like you could hold beliefs that aren't true or you could represent the world in a way that's deceptive to me or things like that, that people understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, uh, I mean, fun fact, one of the reasons why we have these big white uh, sclera on our eyes, you can really see the whites of people's eyes so you can see where they're looking. And um, that um, our very highly developed visual cortex and the ability to perceive that other people could look i don't know that to see them basically the eyes being the window to the soul right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you can see the consciousness and that that there's someone else um where like we are basically highly evolved to figure that out that there's this theory to have a theory of mind to understand that person understands things that i don't understand or has a perspective that i don't have i think Maybe the why it feels so strange, though, to be like this single conscious perspective in the world is because um, or the reason why we want there to be that absolute perceiver or that absolute perception or absolute perspective is because we're so communal and consciousness is um, it's one of the most important sections in Nietzsche. It's in the gay science where he's talking about consciousness. And I don't remember exactly what aphorism it is, but where he talks about how solitary being wouldn't have needed consciousness. That if you just, if we lived like a solitary beast of prey, like a tiger, they wouldn't develop the same level of uh, sentience that we have. Mm -hmm. That, which is basically another way of saying that a lot of the work that's been done recently in figuring out that human beings sort of have a greater grasp of theory of mind than the other primates may point to this fact that the real advantage of consciousness from an evolutionary standpoint comes from the ability to um, it, it's communal and collective, right? It's a very sort of non individualist look at consciousness, mm-hmm. which is surprising to see from Nietzsche for many people, the people who claim Nietzsche uh, was in perfect agreement with Max Stirner. I, there are interpretations of Nietzsche. I hate, 
I don't hate any interpretation of Nietzsche as much as that one that mm-hmm. he and Max Stirner agreed on everything. Like ego, because there's so uh, much in Nietzsche. Max Stirner, right? Like he, ego, he, ego. Like what was the famous book? I forgot the name. Ego. Ego in its own. Oh yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, I, I don't remember the name in, in German, but it's I, it's become more common of people to say that, and um, I just think they haven't read enough Nietzsche to really to to understand that he really doesn't believe that because. Yeah. So that's I guess what I'm saying is like we're having this conscious experience as a human being. We always the thing we've always wanted is to like jump over that bridge of consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we or, have lang- uh, like when they're talking. Sorry, yeah, go on. yeah, and we, we have language, right? And the other mm-hmm. animals uh, or other creatures don't don't have it. Do, do you think that language and reason, or you know, logos, uh, is the primary uh, you know thing which uh, differentiates us from the rest of the world, or like the mind essentially is yeah. uh, is a kind of thing developed because we have language. Right. Uh, there are a lot of ways that, but there are roughly variations on that that I pretty much agree with. I mean, hmm, what would you say? Nietzsche says, uh, um, I believe in different places, he says, we, man is the measure of all things, um, mm-hmm. which was a common saying. And in German, Minch has sort of a, um etymological connection with measuring. Mm-hmm. Um man is the measure of things and so we could say people are the beings that think but as i said there's rudimentary thought in consciousness and other animals man is sort of the creature that values that consciously began to value Mm -hmm. and i think that's an interesting way of putting it how that ties into language is that we could see language as a tool for um what would you say Yes, it's a tool for communication, but um, why is that a valuable thing? Why is it valuable to have communication? And it is essentially to place values on things, mm-hmm. but both in a moral sense, but in a, you know, in the sense of desig- like what is the, when we think back to early, like with the utility of people gaining the power to designate things by language, that's being able to designate this bush is poisonous. Mm-hmm. And so that is an, a very powerful, advantageous thing that a chimp can't do, right? Now, maybe they can to some extent. Well, they can, they can we do, right? But further, they're right. not as sophisticated as uh, we are. Not as sophisticated, right. I think bonobos have like 30 different cries that they've identified where they can tell each other snakes are coming or mm-hmm. identify different predators. So maybe there is language in, in other animals. Also, the work of Fritz Stahl, he was a... Um, I forget what branch of the sciences he was in, but he analy- he went out and analyzed the Agni Kayana ritual in a very rural part of India, which is one of the oldest chants, uh, ritual chanting songs there is. And no one could ever decipher the lyrics because they're not in any known language. And he uh, eventually made the connection that the chants are bird song. Mm-hmm. They're local birds. They imitate bird calls. Mm, so um, did you, did you make, make any sense? Just uh, right. The, there's not yeah. lyrics to them. They're they're mm-hmm. they're people uh, making bird noises. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's interesting about that is his conclusion, because I think he was a linguist, was that um, humans and animals might have the same deep generative grammar, um, and so that's sort of an opposite position from if a lion could speak, we would not understand him is the other i think it was chomsky said that i'm not exactly sure um but so i've heard differing things on that about how how unique our faculty of language really is i i don't i don't really know but we we could say that no one does it to our level of sophistication Mm -hmm. is that Uh, maybe the dolphins yeah uh Let's let, let's try to discuss Amor Fati, like this uh, concept, <laughs> which uh, you know, which uh, I guess uh, related to determinism. And uh, mm-hmm. I guess it was one of my kind of when I when I started first reading Nietzsche before I read Schopenhauer, quite a lot, 
almost like all available works in Russian translation. And I was, uh, it was stunning for me to discover this idea of uh, freedom of will. I never, I was 20, 26, yeah, when I, when I, when I, when I first encountered it and I was thinking, wow, this is, like I've never heard about anything uh, in my life related to this, uh, to this understanding of, uh, of the world so essentially i never even ask questions like that is my actions are my actions predetermined or you know i have free will it was mm. uh, assumed uh, by by default that you know whatever i'm doing it's me who, who is doing actions it's me who is responsible for anything what's going on and then when i discovered schopenhauer yeah it was just like a wow some very unusual experience and then as i start treating nietzsche yeah, I guess it was one of the most uh, impactful concepts, like Amor Fati, basically. I, I think in Stoicism, we have uh, something something like this, something similar. Maybe it's not directly called Amor Fati, but it's also, you know, this uh, acceptance of uh, whatever is going on, right? And uh, yeah, like, what are, what, what are your thoughts on Amor Fati? Um, and, and, so, and, 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 and fatalism, fatalism, in general. like I, I remember yeah. in, one, in one of your episodes, you said like for Nietzsche, it's basically some determinism, it's fatalism, but fatalism yeah. usually is asso associated with some negative connotations, right? So fatalism, right. I guess Nietzsche says about it, like, you know, Russian soldier, and it's in Eke Homa, Russian soldier, mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, when he doesn't want to continue to fight in a war, he just, uh, you know, uh, it's like, sits uh, in the snow and dies. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> I, I, for, I forgot. Your, is that, uh, is is that it, true? Is that war? I don't know. I, I, I haven't been in a war, but. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, wondering if, uh, <laughs> I think that's uh I think that's Nietzsche's um cultural stereotype of Russians that that seemed to be very common among the Germans in the that period of the 1800s. Yeah. Um so he distinguishes multiple types of fatalism that are the negative type that that you describe. He talks about Mohammedan fatalism and Russian mm -hmm. fatalism. Um, but he also, the reason why I chose that word, because I don't know if Nietzsche ever says at any point, I'm a fatalist or something mm -hmm. like that, but because his dictum is the love of fate and also to distinguish it from me mechanistic determinism, really, you could still call Nietzsche's view determinism in my view. I just think that it's, it's a mistake to tie that in with the type of view that basically all of our actions are predetermined because they it's this predetermined chain of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche doesn't believe in that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's actually, because that's yet another illusory thought structure you're imposing upon uh, reality. And that view he actually criticizes as being unhealthy because it's like, it's like you're imagining that you're in chains. <laughs> it's like you're imagining I'm just here to experience life and um, have this conscious experience and my will isn't free though. So all of the suffering and everything that I do is nothing I chose. And so I'm just compelled and like, what a depressing worldview. I think Amor Fati, which is much more, um, Amor Fati is much more of an attitude or an emotional thing. Uh, or a non-rational thing than a philosophical argument or a scientific argument. And I think when you reach the bedrock of a lot of Nietzsche's core ideas, you get into that crossover where it almost ceases to be philosophy and it's almost axiomatic, or you might call it poetic, even mm -hmm. that he's bridging the gap between poetry and philosophy, which is a very contentious gap going back to Socrates, you know, poets are always getting kicked out of the Republic. Mm -hmm. So, um, and more Frati is sort of that poeticism, but I, I think it is central to the Nietzschean understanding of free will and what I call fatalism, which is basically 
Schopenhauer does articulate to some extent where he says a man doesn't, uh, a man can will what he wills, but he doesn't choose what he wills. Um, so whatever it is that you will, again, using will in that sense we talked about earlier, that it's not just, we're not just talking about wants, but what you actually do, which reveals what you're actually the strongest drive within you is, in spite of all the conscious deliberation that goes on in your brain, whatever you have the strongest pull towards doing. Um, we can't say that you didn't choose that. And really the, that's why I find it useful to look back or to use the conceit of if you could replay that event over and over again, you would always do the same thing, um, right? With any decision, you as you were, when you come to any decision in your life and you make that decision, if the only way that we can say that you could make different decisions given different iterations of reality you were a different person. would be if right. if you're a different person yeah. exactly mm -hmm. and so what amor fati is i think is to incorporate this view of what our will is with like a whole total view of ourselves and what i find about the free will libertarianism doctrine that seems very it's like a hidden premise in all of it is that it wants to make all of the things that really shape who we are irrelevant to your will, um, right? That because it's this it's this rationalist Enlightenment era bias that really has seized the Western mind ever since the 1500s. That reason is transhistorical. Reason is reason is that absolute perspective. That it's not a mm -hmm. bunch of people with different perspectives who have had different life experiences, different values, different goals different perceptions on life the idea is if you use reason in the correct way whether you live in eighth century china or the year 2022 in austin texas or uh, russia during the mongolian invasion mm -hmm. you can use reason to come to the same conclusion right and you can always do the most reasonable thing given your circumstances um and the Nietzschean view is no, people don't make decisions based on that. They make decisions based on the person that they are, which is shaped by all these things we mentioned earlier, random experiences of your life, physiology, nature, nurture, um, that aren't just the circumstances in front of you, but like what you've been molded into by all those circumstances that have shaped you. And so, and Morfati is basically about embracing that and saying, <laughs> saying that, my own freedom and my own love of my life has nothing to do with whether if I was given the choice, whether I could have done otherwise. It's about saying like, I know this is the person I am and I would uh, be the person I am every time. And mm -hmm. um, the, the, the scary thing is, I don't think everyone is capable of making that evaluation. That's another troublesome thing with Nietzsche is that there are some lives that I could conceive that you would say, I can't love this life. And um, that's just a sad fact of reality, though. What Nietzsche is sort of saying is uh, a great life will be a life characterized by a more fatigue. Um, and so it, it is, I mean, I think I ended the free will episode with saying like, well, if you have to believe in free will, it's always been your fate to believe that anyway. Mm -hmm. That is really what it comes down to, because I think free will that libertarian idea of free will is a comfort for people who, um, who have not, whose life has not taken them along like a positive course, because that, that introduces an element to them that, well, I could always um, just choose to change my fate. Right. And Hey, maybe that's in the cards for some people, but it's not. Um, I think, I think the idea that we've been given from like the idea of religious revivals of somebody having like a complete, uh, I mean, you see this in a lot of traditions. You see it in Christianity, you see it in Buddhism, enlightenment, right? Or uh, uh, being born again. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of our, how many stories are about this in both popular culture and our mythology is the making a complete personality change, right? Um, I'm not saying that's impossible, but <laughs> I don't think that that's in general how people live and how people change. People gradually are shaped and molded by a series of day-to-day -day events and all these little factors that you are not even aware of. So 
I think things like free will are part of that idea of like introducing this magical, a causal element. One day you might just change your life, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's also, I think that's sort of it's also yeah. as you mentioned, it's kind of source of our guilt, right? So when you yeah, have this absolutely. idea that you know I have freedom, and uh, it make you regret some, you know, if you did something terrible in the past, you know, I, I had, I had, I had. I could escape it if I did something else. I could just change it. And then, mm -hmm. uh, when you live in this framework, when you frame all events and try to uh, think about it from this perspective, you basically uh, always experience uh, guilt for yeah. you know, your. And when if you look at, I mean, go look at a Reddit comment section in a big suburb at some time, mm -hmm. and you will see those same prejudices of the free will delusion people using to go after people and it's funny how casually they'll do it like people will say you could have done otherwise <laughs> you mm -hmm. know which is something that to me is like you're making literally a magical statement you're, you're saying you could have you could have magically altered who you are as a person and not done that if you really wanted to for whatever that means if you really want to what does that mean can i how can i want what i don't want how can I learn to, how can I learn to choose what I don't wish to choose? So all of these things, but it's funny because yes, it's the basis of guilt. So even though it's nonsensical, people really love the idea of guilt because we get so much pleasure out of morality and we get so much pleasure out of telling people they're evil. Mm -hmm. We get so much pleasure out of that uh, or I did the right thing, right? So we'll, we'll take the guilt so long as we can go and um, be really satisfied in telling someone that they're a piece of shit because they could have done better you know and that's not the thing is Nietzsche is very careful to say I'm not trying to go and say that criminals shouldn't have it so bad or we shouldn't you know he's all for uh, punishing for deterrence and all of these things it's not about being like holding hands and singing kumbaya it's just the idea that guilt is a completely all it does it doesn't it doesn't facilitate productive um like what would you say productive life, life, life. political action mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it, it all like we can get all of that without the guilt the only thing that you can only <laughs> get with guilt is moralizing yeah and, and having fun yeah manipulating people right so as soon as you right. try to you know, as soon as you make them feel uh, morally guilty you basically can you know kind of you you you, you may use this feeling to direct it mm -hmm. towards something like against something and say, you know, this is the thing right. that brings it all about. But I would say it's mm -hmm. even, you can definitely do that. And that's how people use it in their daily lives. <laughs> but you can definitely, um, I think you, I think there's a pleasure in and of itself in moralizing. That's mm -hmm. why everyone goes and does it on social media. Mm -hmm. Like not everyone, whatever, you know, but like, I think it's like 10% of my country's population uses Twitter. So, which is a big number. Um, even though it's a still a minority. And if you go and look at Twitter, it is really quite amazing that we've created a public bulletin board for moralizing. That's more or less all it is, is people to go on and make moral declarations. And so why is 10% of the population spending their time like this? I mean, a lot of people make fun of them, but I, I look at it and I'm like, well, it makes perfect sense. They're having fun. Like this is their entertainment. They, um, they're getting something out of going on and saying, you know, uh, if you still haven't caught up with this political position, you're complete trash, uh, you know, retweet if you agree. That's 90% of what it is. And that's, but it makes perfect sense that, I mean, moralizing, it's our national pastime here. So, um, yeah, and, maybe and very, the key element of that is guilt and free will. I guess maybe very contagious, you know, you go, uh, look, some people are moralizing and it uh, evokes certain emotion, certain reaction within you and you basically uh, engage in the same action so it's it's, it's hard yeah that's the whole that's the whole virtue signaling thing which is so yeah. funny people will mm -hmm. go on and say you're virtue signaling it's like mm -hmm. well what are you doing by saying they're virtue signaling mm -hmm. you are doing the same behavior and it is contagious it, but that's that's uh human beings are hyper imitative and so we see people playing a game that looks fun and then we yeah. want to go and play the game too <laughs> So, uh, one of the topics uh, which uh, as 
for me it was one of the most essential topics in Nietzsche and uh, you haven't yet uh, explored it uh, is solitude like Nietzsche writes in many like in Zar Zarathustra and beyond good and evil human not to human about you know solitude as a form of uh, you know being pure staying away from you know modern ideas from 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 all these uh, small influences which uh, basically uh, doesn't allow you to fully express your your passions or focus on one particular thing and work work it out so this idea of solitude uh, do, do you think it's uh, like it's possible now in our modern world to you know to have solitude to live to live life when you may just you know be disconnected from all social interactions you know go for a couple of years in some you know in some place just read books uh, write write certain stuff meditate think yeah um yes and yes i think it is possible so i think nietzsche is correct that there is something about solitude that is um very beneficial again it can't be universal advice because mm -hmm, some people mm -hmm can't live that way yeah but uh, if but you, i think for a certain kind of person you benefit greatly from that yeah, yeah you benefit greatly mm -hmm. from i mean schopenhauer talks about it too he he talks about how you shouldn't read too many books because when you read a book you're letting someone else's thoughts into your head and you should mm -hmm. uh, have as as few foreign uh weeds in your garden of thought as possible mm -hmm. right um but uh so that's even a form of what you, what you would call like even like mental solitude, whereas Nietzsche didn't practice that. He was reading books all the time in his solitude. He just needed to get away from people. So there are different types of solitude. Um, you know, like when I was on tour with my band, that's not solitary by any means. I'm seeing people all the time. And yet for a, the bulk of the day, we're simply, we simply traveled from city to city and spent, you know, eight, nine hours a day just driving and just sitting in the back watching the countryside go by and not talking to each other because we already had said everything that needed to be said a long time ago over many years. And so um, uh, that is its own form of solitude. You can have, um, and so there are all these things, but really the thing is if you want really authentic solitude, if you want to go out completely into the mountains and not be around people nowadays, you can do that, but there's two caveats. You either have to be very wealthy or you have to be willing to um, live without any modern luxuries because you can, I mean, you can go find some land and live in a camper. I think most people could do that. Um, and you could learn how to grow your own crops and all this. You can find cheap land that's not near anything, at least in America, you, they'll pay you to live in Alaska because they need their populate, you get part of the dividend from the oil fund. So uh, if I wanted to, I could go work at a cannery in Alaska or work on a fishing boat for however many half the year, you know, that many months, and then spend the rest of my time in a cabin in the woods uh, for the winter time, because you can make a year's salary in a summer in Alaska mm -hmm. and uh, live without modern conveniences. The problem is, and I include myself in this, we've all already been poisoned by modern conveniences and by the lifestyle of the last man. So it's incredibly hard for us to actually pursue something like solitude and break away from that. Because I mean, and, and a key component of uh, modern finding modern solitude would be getting rid of this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, and so um, how many people, you know, uh, can turn that, can turn the phone off and not even look at it. Like that's, that's a level where other people's thoughts and feelings are getting into your head just on a daily basis all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it is harder than ever, but I think it's completely possible. It, it all just comes down to a question of willpower, of mm -hmm. what, whether somebody would be willing to actually make that break. And that is my eventual plan in life is to, to make that kind of, uh, departure mm -hmm. do, you, but, do, you think, um, do you think to do it at once like you know or just gradually for example uh, mm -hmm. i remember i did lots of experience when i just turned off uh, the internet and didn't use it for like first for a couple of days then for a week 
then I mastered to do it for a month. But then, yeah, I started. Using oh, wow. It. Then I started using it even more. Now I hardly remember even a week. Yeah, for the last five years, since I started studying English, I guess uh, English just uh, dragged me in the, in the internet. And I can't, yeah, I can't even stay a week away from the internet, I guess now. But before it was. It's difficult, I think, to be able to distinguish between, because you're using the same device, right? And so you sit down at your keyboard or you pull out your phone and it's the same activity. Mm -hmm whether or not you're doing something productive and enriching or whether you're arguing with people on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And so I think there's yeah, a really you important... turn you might, you might turn it off. I mean, like I do have a phone. You can turn it off. Yeah. yeah I don't have a phone, but computer, like uh, when I refer to the internet, I basically turn off the computer and I don't uh, touch it for, for like, as I said, for uh, in extreme occasions for a month. But now it's even hard for a couple of yeah. days. I try, I constantly try at least once or twice a month to not not use the internet and still like there's certain there's kind of psychological drive i almost like it's it's like an addiction it's like a it's like a drug mm -hmm. so even even if i don't need anything from there i still have this impulse like right check, you know turn it on watch some video or you know do something yeah i i i feel the same well and that's why it's important i think something that um i've tried to get into the habit of doing is like any habit i have like you're saying take a month off mm -hmm. and if once you discover how i mean you'll learn all like how serious all your addictions are in the course mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. um you know um yeah i but i think it's a valuable thing and i, I think it's i would recommend to more people like whatever your habit is Drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, using the internet too much, um, smoking weed, drinking booze, whatever it is. Um, take a month, like set aside a month and say, I am not going to do this at all for this whole month. And you can go back at the end of the next month, but like commit solidly. I will not touch this. And you will learn, like, if it's something like coffee, you're going to be dying that first week but you'll learn i mean even if you go back to it you will learn the lesson i can live without this and that's why when people try to quit smoking they say like even if you don't quit don't quit quitting because most people have to quit smoking three or four times before they finally stop smoking 300 um, I would say. if not more <laughs> yeah yeah three or four hundred times probably but yeah. every time you're like you're learning um i can be apart from this and uh you're learning what life is like without it and you're building up discipline and even if you fail i mean like i don't know i again it's like i think a lot of these guilt things and complexes and things that are based on this free will shit is what <laughs> actually stops people because they make all these judgments about themselves and it's like no don't don't even make any of those judgments just try to quit again in a month <laughs> Like, you know, keep going, just keep going. Yeah, it's 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 easy when you know how it works, but uh to talk to other people. Like for me personally, I was trying to quit smoking for eight years. So it took me from 2007 oh, till, wow. till 2015. It took me eight years, and uh once a month or once a couple of uh, uh couple of times a year, I got back, whatever something terrible happened, it's like a, almost like a habit. Uh, which uh, you know just it occurs naturally you can control it but every time you make a new commitment it strengthens your 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 intention and finally after yeah. you know 10 15 20 like i guess for me it's literally took like 300 i don't know 300 maybe a few hundred attempts mm -hmm. to quit and finally right. at, some, at one day i just found myself you know that's it that's all. And one year, yeah. two years, three years. Now it's seven years almost. And it's, it's wow, wonderful. it's wonderful. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm in kind of like a like the twilight of my smoking. Like I quit um, like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. I first started quitting like uh, like five or six years ago, and then I quit three or four years ago again. And then um, my main problem is like when I go play a show at a bar or something like that and everyone's smoking mm -hmm. um, yeah and it's a social activity and so i've still 
like over the past couple months, like smoked a few cigarettes, but I don't buy them anymore. I mostly smoke other people's cigarettes now. So that's at least an improvement. Yeah, I guess in uh, Nietzsche, there's I, lots of, you know, there's, uh, I remember the first influence on me, it was Castaneda. I don't know, are you familiar with Castaneda? Carlos, Carlos Castaneda? Yeah. A little bit. Uh, I've tr I've tried to read one of his books. <laughs> so I'll say. I didn't make it all the way. What, what, what one? Which one? Uh, is it the t uh, teachings of Don? Teaching of, yeah, yeah, it's the first book. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they're like the first two books are about psychedelics, and uh, I I wouldn't recommend to start from these two. Like probably the third okay. the third book is the best. Like the uh, uh, journey to Ixtlan. It's okay. Uh, yeah, it, now it's available on the internet. There's a great uh, audio audio books uh, by Lu Luis Morena. Mm -hmm. He's just uh, an awesome reader. But anyway, so for me, it's like the, the first time when I started uh, reading Castaneda, it, it almost was naturally like I, I quit smoking for half a year. It was such a such a great inspiration. And then I remember oh, cool. Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, like all these ideas about determinism. They there was of a, like they helped me a lot to understand myself all these different motivations and impulses which i have so i start i stopped thinking about myself as you know the self and started uh mm. employing kind of Nietzschean framework of there's multiple multiple uh impulses and they can mm. compete for power and basically these like smoking video games and other the other stuff it's it's uh certain kind of <laughs> a part of your personality and there's another part of your personality and they basically fight and you can you try to unite uh one part against uh, the other part and finally you know sometimes well at least uh, in, in my in my in my experience it uh, turned out to the point where first i got rid of all negative uh, habits and mm uh addictions and then there's the fight between like pursuit of physical strength and pursuit of wisdom <laughs> yeah and the pursuit of right. wisdom kind of you know it's like it's almost like everything Nietzsche talks about I can I experience it through my like in my in my inner life so for example this mm -hmm. desire for knowledge it uh, now I don't know what to do with that <laughs> see I started studying right. English and, and uh, at first it was such a amazing experience so i could think for 10 hours every day like from zero like without being yeah. able to understand anything just in a couple of months learning the basics studying thinking developing language and then i started get i started dismissing all the other activities so instead of doing instead of going to the gym instead of running instead of doing some some gymnastics simply no i just want to sit and gain more and more knowledge more and yeah. more with them and then there's the other part and it creates some kind of opposition and says, no, it's like, it's simple. What are you doing? Like you're sitting at the computer for 10 hours a day, like stop it, <laughs> go, right. go, go and run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's like what uh, Freud would call like the super ego, but really it's yeah, like another yeah, impulse. Yeah. It's like some, it's like some third impulse for like organization or discipline. Um, yeah. It, I've, I've had the, the same experience as well. I've, I've found that like, any kind of craft that you hone, uh, that to me is like essential um, for anyone's life. I mean, I, I really dislike the word hobby. People say, oh, you need to get a ho hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some problem with connection. I don't hear you. Oh, uh, okay. Acting okay. in the world. No, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you said, uh, uh, yeah, that's you more said. knowledge and yeah, uh, that's where like knowledge and hobby, hobby. yeah i don't, I don't hobby. like hobby and then there's was a problem with connection yeah it seemed to freeze as well mm -hmm. um but so yeah i don't like the word hobbies um because it's like it's like almost trivializes what it is to um pursue like a craft mm -hmm. and whether it's professional or um, just something you do in your spare time, that's where knowledge and, um, knowledge and physical, what would you say? Acting in the physical world meet, right? Like if you like, you know, for me, it's playing, 
playing an instrument, writing. I mean, writing is a little different. It's because that people could say that's purely a cognitive domain, but in some sense, it's not because um, it's writing a a book or an essay is sort of like building something. Mm -hmm. and yeah, you, you, I, you, I definitely agree. I even think, you know, you had this conversation with uh, Professor Miller, Hans uh, mm -hmm. George Miller, and he talks about profilicity. And he says it's kind of def definite feature of our age. But, uh, you know, I was thinking that since we invented printing, and even earlier, like whenever you try to make something out of language, it's almost the same, like you mm -hmm. build a profile, but now our profiles are more, you know, more alive in a sense. But before right. you just try, write a book, it's like, what is the book? It's you just uh, yeah. kind of expressed in a different form, but it's still like it's a part of you. That's why they all thought it was dangerous when the printing press came out, that mm -hmm. uh, because it was the time when they didn't think that just being able to hear anyone's thoughts on anything was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And so what you mean, Martin Luther, with his challenge to the Catholic Church, can take a printing press mm -hmm. and explode his idea this revolutionary idea across europe uh no that's going to lead to horrible things and it's funny because it, what is it in the intro to beyond good and evil where nietzsche says basically that uh he praises the germans for inventing gunpowder yeah, yeah. but says okay, they made yeah. up for it with the printing press um so that's a nice diss on gutenberg but yeah i think i agree well one of the things moeller said that's interesting is that he you know he's like uh, these these identity technologies don't just like have clear periods we may have been seeing pro felicity sort of come and displace authenticity ever since the printing press mm -hmm. um it's just now the modern version of the printing press which is the computer and the internet is so much more powerful that it has overtaken everything um it's yeah, overtaken still, the still, still write books I guess uh, it will not That's die true. out. So yeah, but but it's one. It's interesting because it's like what his whole framework I can tell is very Hegelian, and it's like I think I think what part of what he's getting across is that pro felicity is sort of like the next because you know like off Haben and which we talk about in that discussion a little bit of Hegel's mm -hmm. right, uh, term he uses of canceling, lifting, and mm -hmm. also maintaining. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as if authenticity is gone, but that there's this new, like pro felicity is like the more fully articulated, developed version of it. And there may even be something after that. And so he kind of raised the question like, well, Jackson Pollock wasn't even authentic. You know, that's well before there was social media that, that really what we, what we see when we come up, when we understand this new thing about identity, when we look back, we can say, um, like as you said like even with the printing press like was there an element of pro felicity to all of that even then right was was martin luther authentically challenging hmm. the catholic church or was there a prophilic element of that even um and so those are the like those are interesting questions to me as well that um was authenticity ever fully authentic Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not convinced that it, it really is that mm -hmm. because and this brings back to another issue in Nietzsche, that same passage on consciousness I mentioned. And, and, and throughout the gay science, he's constantly talking about this issue that we have this conscience inside of us that is like, really, it's the voice of the community and the voice of the morality that mm -hmm. you're raised in. And yeah, super, super, it's super, like the, super, super ego, according to Freud, right? Like super ego. Yeah, the, the co collective speaking in your in your mind basically and so if that's the case i mean human beings are social animals that would imply it's like pro felicity is not really a new thing it's like that element was always contained or the seed of that was always contained within human beings because it's just it's the changing circumstances that make the society or the view of your peers of you more important mm -hmm. and all encompassing and displacing the other things. But there's always been this element of the way that we see ourselves being heavily conditioned by our perception of what others around us in our communities see us or how they see us that. And there's a thing Nietzsche says in, 
it's I think it's in human all to human actually where he basically says we we accept praise um like self praise is one thing but the the view of ourself that we have we only really accept when it comes from other people uh and so what we really want is the praise of others mm -hmm. and so nothing while it comes from vanity uh self love we need we need other people in order to foster our self love because we don't really believe it when it comes just from us so there's always been this element in humanity of like what makes something true is when everyone else thinks it yeah, right we, nobody then, wants to yeah and then try to pretend right so so it's very like i'm trying to kind of learn the differences between like how i uh project myself on the social media and uh, how i project myself like in like in, in, in real world like i mean some ideas and thoughts and types of behavior and it's always striking because uh you know it's very it's very hard to see uh the uh, like the real self so i try to ask myself like am i real when i'm alone and i'm thinking and it's all okay and i just you know understand what's going on or am i real when i talk to people and i i may be confused i may be you know i may say something stupid and like what's what's the reality and and it always yeah. you know it's always easy to think you know what's real it's in in my head and uh whenever i tell to other, whenever i talk to other people is different because you know there's some you know, different emotional components and uh, and mm -hmm. so on but essentially no like the more the more i have experience of uh, talking to people on the internet the more i'm convinced that you know the real is here it's like on the internet and what, what's going on <laughs> yeah. what's, what's going on inside is just basically some kind of you know superstitions or prejudices which i believe yeah i i'm smart because i've read some some of the books but then i have a conversation about these books i see that i can't really articulate anything i think well what what was the point even reading them if i if i now can to understand well that's yeah discussing when it goes back to sort of your first question being able to discuss something and be able to articulate it is sort of what makes it real and substantial and so you kind of have to, I think, yeah, you, you have to, you can read all the books you want, but you have to be able to discuss them or at least take the time to write about them. And that, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Like, I, guess, I, I guess writing is, uh, writing is a good way to do it as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, uh, there's a, it, sorry, I was, was going to say what you were saying reminded me it's a line from Batman begins. Actually, it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you, mm -hmm. which is very trite. And it's from you know a, a blockbuster movie, but it is interesting because that 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 line was was in a mainstream film because most people still think in terms of authenticity of it's what I am underneath that's the real mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. and oh what all of you see you don't really know the real me yeah um, whereas it, so it's it was interesting to me I've thought about that line in that film that it basically is saying uh, no it's not who you are <laughs> underneath that's not like a real thing um it's your actions and so and i think that's very nietzschean actually but yeah yeah uh actually just take few few <laughs> few ideas which i wanted to discuss and now it's been almost two hours uh, i suggest like a few yeah. more uh if you yeah. wouldn't uh, mind uh one of them is uh pity as the last scene i don't like do, do you remember i guess it was in zarathustra when he like when he said pity it was the uh, like the ugliest man or i i don't remember exactly but this idea of pity as the last scene in which uh, Zar zarathustra have to redeem himself last thing he has to overcome basically yeah, yeah. um yeah and um, the, the whole idea of pity in general like nietzsche elaborates on right. it a lot the the reason it's the last thing Zarathustra has to overcome. Zarathustra is Nietzsche, but he's an idealized Nietzsche. Um, that's my opinion on, on the character, that uh, he's not the Ubermensch, um, but he's he's the prophet of the Ubermensch, right? He's mm -hmm. the one who tells us of him. And that's what Nietzsche wants to be. Um, but he has to create this, um, what would you say, this uh, higher elevated dream world version of Nietzsche. That's Zarathustra, and uh, Zarathustra struggles with the things Nietzsche struggles with, and he Zarathustra is still human, all too human, like we are, and pity is the hardest thing to get over, and I'm not going to claim that I'm 
over pity or that I even think that we should be um, to, to a full extent, because I tend to be to the extent that I'm in agreement with Nietzsche. It's that I do see that our modern morality descends from the master and slave morality, but um, I'm not willing to say that everything that comes out of the slave morality is bad. Um, it's just the fact that we have so thoroughly tried to cast out the master morality and pretend like it's not there that we've created this like psychotic civilization basically in my view. Mm -hmm. And so what we really need is to introduce more of the master morality. I don't think we need to focus so much on, I would, maybe that would be a disagreement I have with Nietzsche. I don't think we need to focus so much on making people more pitiless because there are a lot of people who are plenty pitiless because they're not because they're strong self-legislating annihilators of morality who are bringing forth the overman. They're just pitiless because they're spoiled brats who are narcissistic and living for their own comfort and for their own self-preservation. And therefore they don't give a shit about anything else beyond themselves. And so just getting rid of, rid of pity in the sick state that our society is in now, I don't imagine would necessarily be a good thing. But that being said, maybe I should use a different word than pity because I think what Nietzsche is really, um, what he's really talking about is not it's it it's something that is uh yeah in in in, in in russian translation it's compassion it's uh so so stradani right so it's like it's yeah and i and i think that might actually i think compassion is uh that that's the thing is nietzsche would never use the word um like he he would never use the word pity to describe how someone of the noble type of morality would behave, but he might use the word compassion or, or mercy, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is this, a, a distinction there because he, he thinks you could be uh, so overflowing with wealth as a soul that you would not, uh, or so powerful that you're not, you don't even need to crush the weak. Why would you? What are they to you, right? Um, and so that's always important to remember, but what, what he's talking about in pity is, like this, this sense that, uh, what is it? I mean, really on a, on a basic level, it's the feeling of pain at the suffering of others, mm -hmm. that you feel the pain of others suffering. And therefore you're motivated to end the suffering of others and this orientation towards ending suffering. The reason why he wants us to get over it, which is very important to consider is that the, the, the evaluation of life based on the existence of suffering or not, Nietzsche thinks is completely backwards because suffering is a state within our nervous system and our nervous system produces that state in us in order to push us in a certain direction or another in accordance with what our will wants. So suffering is a means to an end it's actually can be a very productive thing or it can be a very useful thing but it's not something it's not uh we shouldn't be making whether there's suffering or not sort of our end right it's a means to an end and so pity sort of reorients us to where we're like our sole concern is with the suffering of the world and reducing it and evaluating how good or bad a state of affairs is based on how much pain there is. Whereas Nietzsche would say, um, you know, uh, in some of the most glorious civilizations that ever existed that created all these wonderful things, there was perhaps a total net increase in pain and suffering as a result. Um, like we might think about Sparta, for example, and how cruel that civilization was, um, both to the helots that they ruled over the people they waged war on and their own people and the discipline they demanded from them and the trials that they put them through and trying to weed them, weed out all the weak. We would, that's a completely pitiless process. And we would look at that with our modern morality and say, that's bad. That's wrong. That's evil. Nietzsche would basically point out suffering is a means to an end. Sparta produced some of the most strong and beautiful human beings that ever lived. Um, so uh, if, suffering and pain can produce these wonderful great things you're harming life by making pity the central value by trying to eliminate suffering mm -hmm. you're trying to 
That's why there's that famous note in Will to Power where he says to those human beings who are of any concern to me, I wish nothing but suffering, hard times, cataclysms. Um, I forget all the other things he says. I wish uh, overdraft notices from the bank. I wish traffic jams. No, he doesn't say all that, but you know what I mean? He's basically just saying uh, all, all of the great things in life come out of adversity and out of overcoming. So this pity thing is diametrically opposed to that. So that's sort of my long winded answer to that. And, and uh, why I think, I think it's very important that we integrate Nietzsche's critique of pity. I don't think we need to get rid of compassion um, or say like, oh, we need to be live completely in the master morality, because I think there is a natural element to that for the same reasons of the, all of the other things we're talking about of people living in this uh, far more communal uh, people's consciousness being far more communal than we're willing to think. Of course we would feel the pain of others mm -hmm. like that. We care about other people and um like uh, Nietzsche's Nietzsche's looking at it. See, when he's talking about pity, he's talking about, I think maybe a really important distinction that I could make that might satisfy some of the Nietzscheans who do want to get rid of pity and what harmonize it with what I'm trying to say is that Nietzsche really doesn't like the Christian universal brotherhood of man idea that we need to feel pity for the whole human race. And just regardless, all suffering needs to end. I think you can harmonize a sense of caring about other human beings with a more healthy, integrated master morality by simply looking at it like there's no there's no shame in loving your family or loving your neighbors or your countrymen. It's just not Christianity takes love thy neighbor to everyone. There's no conflict between anyone. No, mm -hmm. uh, no suffering for anyone. Uh, you know, this, 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 uh, dangerous dream, frankly. Um, and so that is, I think what is important to take from Nietzsche as the critique of pity and why yeah. I still think we could still be compassionate. Yeah. Also the, I, I also don't think that, you know, suffering is essentially a bad thing, right? When we consider, for example, beyond good and ill, there's, uh, the, opposition between bad and uh, good thing if we say suffering is uh, internally bad it doesn't make any sense because uh, suffering uh, it may be it may feel bad at the moment when it occurs but later you still have certain benefits from like you, you don't suffer without a reason right anytime anytime something happens anytime you feel pain it's here because of something else because of certain reason and as soon as you understand your pain oh you may enter like Nietzsche for example in his life he suffered a lot from various diseases from you know being uh not appreciated by uh, his contemporaries not able to understand them and uh, at the same time he doesn't say oh you know it's all terrible everybody just you know there's some conspiracy theory and the world is uh you know <laughs> I, I'm just and uh, you know I, I'm so I'm so miserable so he treats his uh, fate and we can relate it to Amor Fati as well so when uh, you understand that suffering is inevitable when, when you say yeah but there's different way of dealing with suffering so you may uh, succumb to it and say well suffering no I suffer and life is terrible and therefore you you, you may come up with the Christian or super shipping gower and uh, view that the world essentially is uh, right. uh, bad because uh, there's lots of suffering or you may say well suffering is necessary it makes me um, stronger it makes me understand what 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 is necessary what i have to do what i haven't do and then uh, you kind of you reevaluate this uh, idea of suffering and finally well, and, and, also... and finally when oh, you sorry. like look at other people and uh, you know when they suffer and they kind of they uh they almost you know uh, signal you that you have to you know you, you you have to pity them because of their suffering okay. it's uh yeah yeah it looks it's, it's look it looks from this perspective very strange so you instead instead of pitying them you have to give them an opportunity to feel their suffering to understand why they suffer right uh, to be able to the, uh... evaluate it yeah, if it's... There's a line in Human All Too Human where he says that the like sick and dying person, uh, by making you feel bad or feel 
the suffering that they're feeling or suffer on their account, that is their last way of feeling their power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's this way of relating it back to will to power, but also it shows you like, that's an interesting way of like looking at one form of pity. I'm basically like, here I am sick and dying, poor me. Um, this is how I am powerful now is I can make you feel yeah. pain too. <laughs> yeah. um, but it also, yeah, it, it, it also ignores, I mean, this elimination of all suffering, it ignores how pleasure and pain are not these opposite categories. Um, as Schopenhauer points out, like every desire that you chase has a little bit of suffering in it. Every pleasure you seek is a little bit painful. And Nietzsche, I guess, would come along and see that that would be maybe Schopenhauer's argument is like all the times you think you are getting pleasure or happiness out of life, there's pain and suffering in that mix. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche then comes along and says, well, all the times where you think you're it's just pain and suffering, there's some pleasure in that too. Yeah, so depends, depends how you how you basically view it right and essentially you right. might, if you right. like in Nietzschean case right so he was a brilliant writer and uh suffering basically i like my my, my in my opinion uh, it actually made him a brilliant writer so he uh as you, as you said at the beginning yeah. uh, su like this sublimation of uh, emotions into the text just pretty, ins instead of crying about uh, you know and complaining about what, what, he, what he got through he basically put in beautiful language and arranged his thoughts you know and trying to even you know do exactly that I, I don't remember instead of cursing the world he tries to praise the world and say Look right how beautiful it is i'm suffering but still it makes me you know it makes me one of the greatest person since i can suffer and control my you know con control my emotions and uh, control myself yeah, it, it's like if, uh, so I don't know where he, he said it, but there, uh, or I don't remember where Nietzsche said it, but he says the, the cured for misery is misery. And uh, mm -hmm. you do find uh, that a lot of people who we would look at and say, oh, how, how unfortunate people with terminal diseases and people with, uh, who've been crippled in some way or lost the use of their limbs, like a lot of those people end up being on the balance happier mm -hmm. than people who get everything that they want. Mm -hmm. um who are you know it, there's a lot of people sitting in their mansion uh watching their life slip away who are absolutely in torment and there are a lot of people who are quadriplegics who have a completely positive view of life and so what do you make of that if you're um you know a pessimist or an antinatalist or whatever mm -hmm. it's like and and if pleasure and pain are inextricable if there's always an element of both, then the question just becomes it's like, okay, do you want to take on all the whole panoply of experiences in life and all of its pleasures and pains and all of that intermix? Or do you, would you rather just not exist? And if, if we accept the atheistic idea that you just come into existence and then you die and you're gone, why not experience it? Who's once you're dead? When, what was yeah, the harm? Yeah, no, no, nobody. Yeah. <laughs> what was the harm in being alive, really? And if and if there is some world beyond that you will go to, then if that's eternal, then what was the harm of this temporary little inconvenience of being alive? And that's why I think there's like a a morphati. Uh, there's almost a kinship with the with the Taoist writers, even though they're opposite Nietzsche and many of their values. Um, of just sort of just let life, let life pass, you know, <laughs> just uh, live. And while you're here uh, and don't cling on to life, let it pass you by when it passes you by. Right. Um, and I think there's like, there is some sort of wisdom to that in, in the same sense that Nietzsche says, where he's talking about on, on the voluntary death where he's like, um, you know, do you want to spend basically uh, the gist of it is like, you want to spend your life like clinging on to just existing or would it be better to die spectacularly and squander a great soul? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, um, like you know, I, all I, of these, it's in Iliad, uh, Achilles uh, basically says these lines, like what's better to die when you are young and powerful, uh, you know, you know, in the battlefield or mm -hmm. live the, till, you know, the old age and suffer from some diseases and die in a, you know, in a terrible condition he does not right have, yeah i want to go in the battlefield to die there yeah well it's it's like yeah and so there we have with nietzsche it's like uh rejecting the simple pleasure pain dichotomy and then also saying 
uh, dying can be a way of loving life or making mm-hmm. peace with death as a way of loving life. Um, mm-hmm. So it's all of these like all of these sort of pessimistic considerations about life, I think, um, I think Nietzsche is really provides an antidote to that um, or provides just an alternative um, perspective on it. Mm-hmm. It's like he says, uh, what is it? Uh, one of my favorite lines is it's in human all to human where he says the brevity of life could make it a, you know, could make life an elixir that's as sweet as honey in its shortness, you know, but you poison brewers and alchemists have turned that shortness of life into a curse and a poison mm-hmm. that it's like, yeah, but sometimes the, it's also, you know, some, sometimes, some, sometimes like in the stripping gallery case, like uh, just, you know, cursing life is also maybe very, very, very fun and uh, not fun, but you know, yeah, he, 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 did, he definitely took some pleasure in, in, in writing. It's, all it's, a, it's another way of, of expressing your power. Yeah, but he's I condemn the whole world. Yeah, I, yeah, you know, like what's more powerful than that? I reject your whole earth. Yeah, I reject this whole existence. It's bad. I stand in judgment of it. I, I yeah. think there's a power element in that too. I mean, it's, it's not uh, entirely pessimistic when you, when you look at this from from this standpoint. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, it was uh, fun to talk talk to you i really appreciate that you found time i hope we'll make more conversations in the future thank you for uh having me on i can't believe it's already been almost two hours yeah, it's been but two i guess hours. it has yeah i guess i guess i'll <laughs> stop it here